Okay, so as I said, my name is uh, Gillian Rose and I'm PI on this ESRC funded project um, looking at Milton Keynes as a case study uh, of this notion of the smart city. Uh, and one of the reasons we chose Milton Keynes um, uh, is that uh, there's an awful lot of different kinds of smart city experimentation, as, as it's described, uh, going on from uh, driverless cars to citizen generated apps uh, to open data hubs uh, and so on. Uh, and the other reason we, we, we really wanted to, to, to explore um, uh, how these particular uh, various smart city projects were working out in the city is that it's also um, uh, very socially divided and, and also diverse city. Milton Keynes has some very uh, deprived uh, neighbourhoods, uh, also some very wealthy ones. And one of the, the, the kind of key research questions that we had, um, and this is our paper title, um, is to think around uh, how different kinds of smart technologies, smart policies, smart devices, smart data, both work alongside and reproduce existing forms of social difference, the kind of social differentiations that I guess you know, social sciences have been you know, familiar with and we've been working with for, for many years, as sort of class, gender, race, sexuality, and, and so on. Um, but we're also particularly interested in exploring what new forms of social differentiation might be emerging alongside these, uh, these various kinds of, of technologies, devices, uh, and data interventions. Um, so, uh, in, in try thank you. Trying to uh, work um, through that, as I said in my, my brief opening remarks, you know, data is really the, the core of, of the smart city. Um, data is a you know, highly um, sort of um, diverse range of, of things, um, but we were particularly interested in the ways in which um, data travels through the city, as indeed the, the smart policies and other smart smart devices. Um, I'm trying to think about how they uh, um, engaged with you know, particular users, um, but also had a kind of agency in generating uh, other forms of, of, of identities and so on. Uh, and we were particularly inspired by a, a couple of, um, a couple of uh, approaches, um, Baker and McGurk in particular, thinking about circulations of policy. Um, a lot of smart stuff is around as much policy as it, as it is around the kind of technologies and the data. And so we were interested in looking at circulations of data, but also uh, Jo's project with her colleagues, uh, thinking about uh, data circulation specifically. Um, and we've got those three broad approaches uh, that we were pulling out. Uh, in terms of thinking about kind of methodology for this. One was to go to the places where things are done with data and policy and observe with a, with a kind of ethnographic sensibility what's, what's happening. Um, and we were particularly interested in thinking about the kind of work that has to be done to make these kinds of devices uh, function uh, or, or uh, not, or to make data or, or policies circulate or, or not. Uh, and that notion of the kind of labours of pulling these things together and making them hold. Um, Again, we, we travel a similar trajectory to Joe's pro project, which is that once you start looking at that, you also see how these things fall apart for all sorts of reasons as well. There are frictions of many kinds, technical uh, funding frictions, stakeholders' disagreements, and, and so on and so forth. And tracing the site situations, circulations of these things, it was, is a, we, we think was a really, really good approach uh, to um, beginning to uh, map this, this particular configuration uh, of, of SMART. So, uh, well, I just want to talk through briefly uh, one um, of our case studies, and then uh, Miguel will, will talk in more detail about another. Uh, I've got a particular interest in, in, in visual culture uh, and what digital technologies are doing to, to visuals. Um, kind of ironically, I'm getting more interested in spatialities and circulations and sonic <laughs> things, which um, certainly in smart cities, um, a whole range of different kinds of digitally produced visuals are absolutely crucial uh, to how smart cities work, both in the kind of hype of what they're about. They're, you know, the, the, the big corporations put a lot of money into their advertising, into their YouTube channels, into their digital animations that show you how marvellous the smart city uh, is going to be. Um, but there's also a lot of very, um, what we might call op operative images as well, in dashboards. Um, we might think of, of, of interfaces kind of moving away from the representational into, into making you do, do something uh, rather than show, you know, give you meaning and so on. So we, we, um, uh, to, to address those sorts of issues, I just want to go through these extremely briefly. We've tried to pull out three different kinds of approaches, uh, one of which is a kind of content analysis 
of the uh, range of images that, that the key stakeholders of, of SMART in Milton Keynes uh, put on their websites, their social media sites and other kind of promotional materials, you know, brochures, uh, policy statements, vision statements uh, and so on and so forth. We, we've gathered an, a corpus of about, I think it's about 600 images at the moment, uh, which we have scanned, but actually that's manageable for us to, to do that content, content analysis using me, conventional methods uh, manually. Um, I've also experimented using uh, Lev Manovich's um, software called ImagePlot, scraping images attached to uh, tweets about smart cities and trying to think through the kind of uh, configurations um, or particularly of colour, actually, um, uh, across there and, and how, how those different sort of st uh, tweeting streams might make you feel about being, being smart. Um, and then finally, something that um, uh, Ed Wigley, uh, the third co-author of this paper, ha has been particularly interested in, uh, and I'm afraid I've not uh, been peering over his shoulder in any detail in this, so uh, any technical questions may have to be addressed to him directly. Um, he's really interested in picking out some of these key images, and this is one produced by Arup, a uh, very large uh, global consultancy, but very heavily involved in this smart city uh, market and trying to um, do using Google image search, reverse image search, to find out where these images get uh, circulated. Um, a previous project of mine suggested that digital uh, visualizations, there's, there's quite a clear global division of labor and global divisions of, of circulation, if you like, between the kind of, although many cities in the global south are going smart, you can see here uh, the uh, distribution of that particular image seems to have landed in, uh, in uh, Western Europe, uh, in the east and western seaboards uh, of the US, and not really many other places, uh, which suggests you know, perhaps a kind of particular uh, dynamic uh, of, of visual circulation as much as it does um, uh, a policy circulation uh, as well. Um, and some questions that that prompts me, and we've, the, the, that map is relatively recently produced, so I'm afraid I don't have any very clear answers to this yet, but I'm interested in you know, who, who's creating these images, who is recirculating them, what kind of uh, spatially located um, uh, networks are, are embedded and, 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 and um, uh, kind of uh, highlighted by that pattern of circulation. And maybe, um, you know, as someone who's interested in visual culture, but again, starting to rethink how we think about the visual, you know, perhaps it's a circulation. It is that dynamic of their movement that's maybe more important than kind of trying to do a sort of semiological reading of, 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 what, they, of what they show. And particularly because I think uh, certain um, places are, are, are shaping that visual language more, more than others. Uh, and finally, a question I want to raise... Um, because again, I wonder, how, uh, it, it, it's a puzzling one for me, the reception of these images. When we show them to audiences talking about smart cities, people are incredibly skeptical about them. Obviously, as you could see that Arab one, you know, flying cars and glossy skyscrapers, and this is all, you know, everybody's very, um, it, very easy, uh, uh, very, finds it very easy to critique those sorts of uh, images. Um, but nonetheless, the companies keep on producing them. <laughs> they keep on being circulated. Um, you know, there's an interesting question about, about what kind of audiencing uh, is happening there. Okay, thank you. So moving on to our second case study. Uh, oh, yes. Our second case study, it's about the story of two data infrastructures. Because smart cities are supposed to be all about using big data for making decisions about the urban, but that is not new. People have been using data in cities from ages ago. So for me, this case study is about the kind of data that people were using in Milton Keynes before SMART happened, then SMART lands into the city, and it assimilated what was there before. And in assimilating it, it made it different, changed its priorities. So I will come back to this for now. What is important is that we had an intelligence observatory for social difference in 2003, and then SMART landed in 2014, and in 2017, SMART assimilated what was there before, so the observatory did not exist anymore. But, but going back to how did we went about unraveling this story, what we are trying to do is to follow the journeys of data and of policy as data went from one infrastructure to another. And I keep talking about data and policy because in this case, when you talk about smart city policy, you cannot make policy without the infrastructure. 
usually smart city policies assume the existence of a certain data hub, of a certain sensor system for monitoring traffic in real time, for example, of a certain sense, set of census data, a certain application. So when data travels, policy travels with data as well. And well, here for talking about what we did methodologically, we took policy documents as our starting point. Particularly, the Smart City project in Milton Keynes is organized around a set of core documents, like the MK2050 vision. So if we go through that document, we look at all the other documents that are referenced there. We look at all the people who had an input into that document and all the data sets that fed into the making of that document. Then we can jump to the next step in this journey. And then we have to follow an iterative process and look at this new document and do it all over again. See which documents, which data sets, which actors are referenced there. And once we keep tracking step by step, we can start putting together a map and a sort of oral history of how, of how SMART landed into and changed Milton Keynes and, and made some things new and destroyed some others. This was made very easy, the documentary part at least, because the City Council in Milton Keynes keeps very good track of its documents. You can enter MK2050 vision and see minutes of all the city council meetings where they discuss something about it and all the big documents, the small documents, the boring documents they produced. And eventually we connect that in a map. We tried to use post-its initially and it quickly got out of control. <laughs> so not that, I, not that I want to publicize it particularly, but we found it very useful to use this particular data visualization platform, which was almost like using post-its, except that when you want to shuffle things around, you can just tell the system, please center on this so we can see everything that is emanating from here and now, or please look at everything that is emanating from here and now. But well, assume it was post-its, just made easier with software. And okay, so now that's about it for our method. We, uh, sorry, going back to one slide, please. As I said, sometimes tracing the next step involved looking at the next set of documents. Sometimes it was about interviews. We got to interview some people. Sometimes it was looking at the <coughs> metadata to see where that bit of data had been imported from. And sometimes when everything else failed, we could even look at the newspapers clippings. We got to situations where the council person who had made some key decision was not around anymore, but they had granted an interview to some newspaper 10 years ago. So our method was whatever it takes to get from here to here and to see how they landed here. So, okay, now this is the story, the kind of oral history of data in Milton Keynes that we managed to assemble together. So, 2003. The Intelligence Observatory is commissioned with one specific goal, understanding difference in health outcomes through data, all the data from the city they could get their hands on at a high resolution level. It was important to them that they could understand health inequality at a postcode level. And gradually it developed fertile functionalities because as they kept accumulating more and more data to understand health outcomes, they found that a lot of it had to do with multiple deprivation index and that they could start correlating health deprivation with all the other bits and pieces that they had lying around. And well, this is what deprivation looks like in a map of Milton Keynes. And the reason why a lot of people became interested in this is because voluntary organizations, community organizations, uh, the fire department, I don't know, Everybody who wanted to do some kind of intervention in Milton Keynes could say, we don't have to cover the whole of the city. Look like Fisher Mead is where they really, really need our help. And well, maybe it is quite obvious, but having this map at very high spatial resolution created a very tight coalition of actors over time. Because well, 
This data infrastructure was originally used by the city council. It was hosted in the council, and the idea was that anyone in the council would know where to find, find what they needed. But they made it available to a lot of people. Over time, the scope became not only that of a data hub, but something of a data-driven ecosystem that was connecting authorities, citizens, communities, eh, and it sounds smart in many ways, and we're talking about 2003. By the time this ecosystem had developed, it may be 2007, say, which is roughly 10 years before smart cities became fashionable, which our point is in a way that smart is a new label for things that people have been doing all along. And an important thing that we discovered in trying to trace this journey is that a lot of the jumps of the data were not made through computers, through applications. Again, because we were talking about 2007, but it was done face to face by people, initially by people from the city council, by the Milton Keynes Intelligence Unit, and then later by volunteer community organizations like Community Action, MK. So we had this computer, this infrastructure, these data sets, being aggregated in servers, but some human factor, some human network has to actually make sure that it has some impact on what's going on on the streets. And then 2014 happens, smart city happens, the city council gets about 16 million for this smart city project, MK Smart. And by 2017, the data infrastructures for this smart city project replaced the MK Intelligence Observatory, the old one. And this was largely because austerity. We got to see the minutes for the council meeting when they decided we don't have money to keep the observatory open anymore. And the Open University can do this instead. And they thought that it was equivalent in a way, they say, we have this server, this data hub, to make all the information available in one stop. And it makes no difference if that data hub is sitting in the city council or if it is sitting in the open university. Data is data. They assume that it would flow like oil, frictionlessly, so it doesn't matter where you store it. But what we have realized is that the logic of the smart city is very different to that of the observatory. As I said, the old observatory was looking into very high spatial resolution. It wanted to be able to understand what was happening in, in this, particularly the private state, council state, this particularly the private city block. And the new logic of SMART turned out not to be so much about spatial resolu resolution, but about temporal resolution, about real-time data, urban flows, and largely for technology development, knowledge economies, and increasingly efficient use of infrastructure. Here, then, data is used, for example, so the driverless car can choose the optimal route to drive through the city without bumping into congestion. So it needs to know where people are, but not if people are in good health or not, or if they have employment opportunities or not, unless they happen to be knowledge economy, employment, economies. So the observatory and MK Smart represented, made visible and make possible different versions of Milton Keynes. Now I think I am almost running out of time, so I will, I will rush through this one. But the point is, as I mentioned, MK Smart is hosted in the Open University, where fortunately we happen to be working in the Open University. So we were able to go to them and tell them, you know what, this data infrastructure was working in a different way in the past. And as a consequence of that, we are able to use the, what we gathered from the data journeys approach to tell them, hey, let's retrace this journey because it was a good journey. It was a good network. Let's put it back together the way it was, but using the smart city technologies now. So now we are trying to find the people who worked in the old intelligence unit and try to figure out what were the matters of concern, the, 
data journeys, the flows, so that we can reconnect it and refacilitate the making of social difference visible and actionable in the way it were. We are finding the challenge that the insight team wants to replace human facilitators with automated processes because that is the logic of smart. Everything has to be automate, automatic. Everything has to be artificial intelligence. So it's hard to fight the logic of smart, even if we are trying to reconstruct what was there before. And well, this is our conclusions so far, that smart cities are a convergence of journeys, difficult to disentangle from each other, of policies, of imaginaries, of infrastructures, people, and data. The observatory, MK Smart, made different forms of urban life visible and actionable. So data here is not value neutral. It makes different things possible. And we are trying to figure out how to use different methodologies to disentangle these assemblages and these entangled journeys. And in the case of smart cities in the making, this is not just an academic concern of understanding how the city, the smart city is made. We are, because the smart city is being made right now, we are trying to collaborate with those that are enact, enacting these new journeys to ensure that the consequences of the new forms of data, the new mobilities, the new visibilities are taken into account and hopefully are made more fair and more inclusive. And I think that's about it. So we can take questions for all the presentations. I think it is time. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you.